World Cup match between India and Pakistan. Hindu and Muslim leaders in the city say tensions being provoked on social media. Today, they've joined forces to call for calm. The police say there'll be a significant operation in place for several days. Jeremy Ball reporting. Thank you very much, Lisa. You're listening to the Westminster Hour with me, Carolyn Quinn, as we prepare to mark the moment when Queen Elizabeth's coffin will make its final journey after four days of lying in state in Westminster Hall to Westminster Abbey for the state funeral. Joining me this evening, the former Cabinet Minister, Baroness Nikki Morgan, who served as Culture Secretary in Boris Johnson's first period as Prime Minister, and as Education Secretary and Minister for Women and Equalities during David Cameron's last two years, in office. She sits in the House of Lords now. Hello to you, Nikki. Good evening, Carolyn. Hello. And uh, hello as well to Baroness Jenny Chapman. Until 2019, you were Labour MP for Darlington, weren't you, and served on the opposition front bench in various roles. After that, becoming Sir Keir Starmer's first political secretary and now also sitting in the Lords, where, Jenny, you are Shadow Cabinet Office Minister. Good evening to you. Hi, Carolyn. And here in the studio, I'm joined by Lord Kim Darrock, who was Britain's ambassador to Washington from 2016 to 2019. Before that, he was the national security advisor during the coalition years and the UK's permanent representative to the European Union. Welcome to you, Kim. And Good also here with us is Politico's UK editor, Jack Blanchard. So big welcome to you all. Quite an evening, quite a few days coming up hundreds of thousands of people have queued to pay their respects to her majesty over the past four days uh, to glimpse for a few precious moments the coffin on its purple draped catafalque the extraordinary sight of the imperial state crown resting on top global heads of state have been arriving in london and tonight king charles has been hosting them at a reception in buckingham palace Nikki, what are your reflections as we reach the end of a momentous 10 days well, I think it's very difficult to, at this stage, really um, process it all, isn't it? Um, I think there, uh, I was in Westminster Hall um, as one of the, uh, the, the peers, uh, and there were members in the House of Commons as well, uh, who was there to receive uh, the Queen's coffin when it arrived on Wednesday afternoon. Um, and it was a very moving and solemn and dignified occasion. I think we sort of run out of words almost. Um, but of course, amidst all of this is a very grief-stricken family but also uh, the accession of a new king and a new era. And I think there's a whole sort of mix of emotions. I think people are very surprised that they've been as affected as they have been by the death of the Queen and um, how uncertain things feel after having such a familiar person mm. around for 70 years. Um, I think the other thing I'd just like to say, and there will be obviously a time for this as well, but um, as a former culture secretary, um, I just know how many Department of Culture, Media and Sport officials will have worked around the clock uh, to to get things um, sorted, as is cabinet office officials, people from the UK Parliament, obviously the security services, the police, and many, many others. Um, and to do all of this on the scale that we're going to see tomorrow in less than 10 days is truly extraordinary. And the result of people, as I say, literally working flat out with no sleep for the whole of that time. I want to get into the, the security operation, the fact that you've got so many foreign dignitaries coming from around the world to attend the state funeral in just a moment. Just just a couple more quick reflections from you all on, on this moment. Jenny, th there was a, a UK-wide moment of reflection at 8 o'clock this evening, a realisation perhaps that in this moment the world has changed. You know, a constant a certainty has gone from our lives. I think so. I but the overwhelming sense I get is that people feel very respectful and thankful um, and appreciative of the contribution and the leadership that the Queen's given us and that stability. Um, and I, I feel that there's, there is a sort of, tomorrow will be a very sad event, but it's also one of um, almost celebration of a life lived so well and in service to us. Um, as a nation and I think people feel quite uplifted almost by the coming together that they've experienced and even people who aren't queuing and aren't taking part personally and, and being present there is a sense that something has happened in our nation um, and that there is a moment of change but it's a change that's being very very well managed that there's stability here and that it, it's something we can be quite proud of and quite thankful that we live in a country where 
these transitions take place in the way that they do. Mm. Uh, I feel that even people who are not generally that supportive of the monarchy um, have, at this moment, felt a sense of respect and appreciation for everything that the Queen did. And I, I think that's a good thing, and I, I value that, and I'm glad that we're able to do that as a nation. And, and Kim Darrick, the, the Queen meant so much, it seems, to other heads of state around the world. I mean, you, you've worked in the United States, you've mm. worked in the EU. There does seem to be a genuine outpouring from world leaders, doesn't there, about what's happened? There really does, and uh, both a number of, of foreign heads of state and government who are coming to, to the state funeral tomorrow but also what they've been saying has been extraordinary and really, really very moving. Um, I thought President Macron's message, for example, his statement afterwards was uh, an extraordinary piece of prose. We've seen what, uh, what President Biden has said, but there are, there are dozens more expressions like that uh, around, um, around the international community. And tomorrow will be, will be the biggest diplomatic gathering I suspect of all of our lifetimes. Uh, I don't think there's ever, ever been anything like this, like this before, and it will be it will be extraordinary. Mm. The other thing I'd say very very quickly is, first of all, as uh, as Baroness Morgan said, the planning for this has been around in Whitehall for more than a decade, um, and obviously <laughs> there were changes in the short term that have to be made, but it's it's worked extraordinarily well. It's magical how smoothly everything has gone so far and touch with it goes smoothly tomorrow. Second, I think that, that, that King Charles III, as we now, we now know him, has been absolutely pitch perfect in his handling of it. His statement on television the day after his mother's death, I thought, was exceptional. And his getting out of his car to meet the crowds outside back in, Pol back in Paris, going to meet the, uh, the queue yesterday. He's just been brilliant in the way that he has managed mm. it, which is hugely encouraging, of course, for his, for his reign. Uh, and Jack Blanchard, that queue is still out there, isn't it? Um, you know, Westminster, people know that uh, 6.30 tomorrow, the, the lying in state finishes, um, and still they're out there braving another cold night as they wait to pay their respects. Yeah, there's another few hours um, to go for the, the ardent queuers among us. I was in central London yesterday and just happened upon the queuers. I was wandering down past London Bridge and these people, everyone was in such good spirits, even though it wasn't exactly the warmest of afternoons and they had goodness knows how many hours to go. It was hardly moving at all, but you didn't see anybody complaining. They were all enjoying themselves. So, um, yeah, it's, it's quite a spectacle to see. And uh, Nikki, Nikki Morgan, you were talking about the, the logistics of this, the... the the government Whitehall staff that have been involved uh, the government had years of course to plan for other big events but this has all been done so quickly it's the equivalent it's sort of setting up hundreds of state visits in just two weeks how involved were you when you were in the cabinet well one of the first things i did about i think probably the, the first thing i was given to read as, as culture secretary was something called the bridges protocol which is um exactly what will happen uh, in the event of the, the death of senior royal and obviously we've seen some of that play out over the years with um, Princess Diana's funeral, uh, the Queen Mother obviously lying in, in state. I don't think we've seen it all on the scale. So uh, it has been fascinating from my knowledge of, of that a little bit to, to see it all uh, happen. But of course, um, you know, every every year and certainly every decade, there are new forms of technology. So for example, um, I suspect if you'd been talking about this, you know, five, ten years ago, you wouldn't have had live tweeting of where to join the end of the queue, for example. Mm. And of course, um, I mean, that fantastic impromptu walkabout that the King and Prince of Wales did yesterday, the, the, again, people in the queue, I don't think that's probably in the protocol, but you know, it just felt right to do it, given people waiting hours and hours. So it has to be very flexible uh, as well. But I mean, it would have been a massive cross-departmental effort. Um, and of course, don't forget that many of these ministers are literally brand new in their roles. Uh, so, um, and civil servants obviously move around. So, uh, although some will have been working on this for a number of years, many people have been literally pitched into it at the last minute. And the fact, Kim, Darrett, that we've got 500 heads of state and dignitaries from across the world expected to attend. Uh, you, they've been going to Buckingham Palace, some mm. of them, tonight. They will be at the state funeral tomorrow. Is that a national security nightmare? How do you plan and work around that? I mean, yes, it is, because 
every one of them, while they're on British soil, their safety and security is our responsibility. So we have to take that very seriously. No wonder they have drafted in 10,000 police officers it is into, into London, because security will be a big, big, um, a big, big challenge. Um, and in that context, if it is true that they are going to be bussed into the service, um, that's why, because if you had 100 cars breaking through the security cordon to disgorge their passengers, which would in itself take an hour, an hour and a half, mm. it would have been a much even bigger security challenge. President so, Biden's brought the beast over yeah, the, the big mean, armoured car, though. I mean, we will see tomorrow whether he has indeed got a pass uh, of avoiding the buses and whether he's the only one or whether, as is sometimes rumoured, that one or two other presidents have got them as well. But I'm sure the majority of... of, of of heads of government and heads of state will be on buses and uh, you know this is not about them this is this event this is about commemorating and celebrating uh, the extraordinary life of an amazing woman they can't all be on the front row some of them will have to be in row F that's just the way it is but it's still the hottest ticket on the planet let's see who has to pass that message on to them tomorrow um, Anyway, tomorrow we will have the Queen's coffin leaving Westminster Hall for the last time. The state funeral will take place after 10 days of national mourning. Throughout the ceremonial moments, King Charles coming to Parliament last Monday to hear condolences from MPs and peers and the moment when the coffin was carried gently into Westminster Hall on Wednesday. The Speaker of the Commons, Sir Lindsay Hoyle, has been present and he will be there tomorrow morning as Her Majesty heads off on her final journey. I spoke to Sir Lindsay on Friday. Friday, and he described how emotional he expects the occasion to be. It's going to be a very moving moment. It's been moving all the time. London will come to a standstill. We will never, ever, in my opinion, ever see anything like this again. It will be an emotional moment for you. Very much. Personally. What precisely will be your role tomorrow? I will be here to meet the royal family. I will be there when they go into Westminster Hall for them to pay the final respects within the Great Hall. I will then lead them to the door. The coffin will be taken away and basically we close the doors as the coffin leaves. I've then got to get to Westminster Abbey ahead to make sure I'm in my seat and in my position. So literally having anything more to do will end, as you say, tomorrow once the doors, the great doors are closed. In that sense, that's the last official part of what I will have to, apart from being part of that, what I will believe will be a very moving service in Westminster Abbey. I'm watching the whole, what feels like the whole of the Navy will be on duty and the armed forces and the Royal Marines and the bands, etc. Watching that has been phenomenal. At four o'clock in the morning, I was watching the gun carriage being assembled and the ropes laid out because of course this isn't being pulled by horses mm. this is being pulled by the navy and it's very interesting you know i said how do you pick within the navy and they said we go for an average height nobody too small nobody too tall and it's wonderful and this is about men and women of the navy for the first time will be pulling that gun carriage it's always been men in the past but not this time and I think that is a fitting tribute as well. You've been on show yourself in your various ceremonial dress. You made a speech when King Charles came to Westminster Hall to hear from you yourself and the Lord Speaker. In your address, you reminded him of the weight of his constitutional responsibilities and the limitations that they place on him. Why did you feel it was important to underline the point that you make? We, we know you hold in the greatest respect the, the precious traditions and our system of parliamentary government. I think it's about we have to work together. We are the elected house. We're not the elected house. So I think it was about putting the case for the Commons. And that's what I wanted to do. A reminder of the important role of the elected members. We are the senior house, and it's always nice in a very gentle way to remind people of how important the House of Commons is and the members that serve their constituencies. What's your relationship like with King Charles now? Do you know him well? We've both been in prison together. 
<laughs> and I say that in the nicest possible way. Have I got a new scoop here? <laughs> but he did come to Chorley, we've got the prisons just outside Chorley, and we were looking at uh, the training of prisoners when they leave and trying to get a job back outside the walls of prison. And I did remind him on our last meeting, he went and told everybody, he said, last time I was with the speak, you know, we were both in prison. So I, 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 you know, it's, uh, so I have got to know him, and uh, he's, um, I think he's going to be a great king. I thought I'd had a long apprenticeship to become speaker, but it is nothing compared to the king, the apprenticeship that he served before he's become our monarch. So I think in some respects I can look and say, yes, I know what this is like. I generally say I, I think it's going to be good, it's something different. I always say about speakers, I'm the 158 speaker, the one thing we have in common, or two things in common, one we've all been speakers, but we've all been different, and I think it's the same for the royal family. The traditions will be there, but it'll be a different style and a different twist, and I think people will love the style and the twist that he will bring to this magnificent role. Obviously, the normal politics have been on hold, haven't they, during the mourning period, but that will change this week. How quickly do you anticipate things slipping back into the, the way they were? Because there's been a momentary pause in hostilities, if we could describe it like that, but do you think it's just going to get back to normal? I'd like to think not, but I'm a realist. What I would say is, I think... And Whenever we say this, when the house needs to, it comes together and it is by far at its best. And I think it was wonderful to be a speaker where the house is united as one. And I don't believe I'll ever see the house that good and that great again. I would like to believe so. I hope from now we can be slightly better to each other. We can show a little more tolerance and certainly a lot more respect to each other. And I. I'd like to think that will be the way that we'll go forward. That will be a wonderful legacy to the late Queen and to the new King going forward. That was Sir Lindsay Hoyle, the common speaker. Nikki Downey Street have been insisting, haven't they, that the funeral is no time for politics, but some of the leaders have had private meetings with the Prime Minister in advance of the funeral, um, except for President Biden, who should be meeting at the UN next week. How important a moment is it for her? I think it is important for the leader. I don't think we should forget that she has, of course, been Foreign Secretary. So she will have met um, mm. some, not 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 all, um, but but uh, some of them, and ha already have a presence on the uh, the world stage. So, but I think you can't be face to face contact, uh, however brief, um, even if you don't discuss particular issues of, of substance. I think just being able, as um, you know, one prime minister to another, or, or one leader to another, to look each other in the eye, you know, shake hands, have a quick conversation, start to build that personal. Uh, relationship hopefully so that you know when there is a, a problem or a thorny issue you're able to pick up the phone um, and um, uh, and go straight in so I think of course this is an important moment but I think I have to say again you know uh, new prime minister what two days into the job when mm. uh, the almost unthinkable happened I think that Liz has um, handled everything extremely well and being very aware of the fact um, that as somebody said earlier on uh, it's not about the, the leaders tomorrow it, it's not been about the politicians uh, mm. over the course of the last 10 days it's very much been uh, about the um, uh, our, our previous uh, queen and our new king and, and Jenny obviously you would much rather this were Sir Keir Starmer in the prominent position the Prime Minister welcoming all these heads of state but how will Labour be represented tomorrow Sir, Sir Keir will be at the funeral presumably will former leaders and former Labour Prime Ministers be there? Um, I don't know the guest list for the funeral, but uh, I mean, obviously if, um, you will have seen every Labour leader um, from Kinnock to, to Kia there um, at, at recent events. And, and, and the, the sort of sense from the Labour movement has been quite powerful, I think. But I think that, as others have said, you know, this isn't about politicians and using this as some sort of platform to show what great statement they can be this is very much a moment to mark um the passing of the queen and it's it's something that i don't think the public really are in the mood for that sort of the lack of dignity that that would involve so i would expect here to, to i know that he will um conduct himself with with utmost dignity but something that 
I think he would bring um, is an ability to form good relationships with partners across the world, and we are going to need that. You know, we're we're a country now that is seeking to do new trade deals and to forge new relationships internationally. This is quite a precarious time internationally, and I think Keir would would do that very very well okay. were he to be our prime minister. Um, Jack, there, there has, however, been a bit of a, a diplomatic flurry, a, a row over some of those invited. Mohammed bin Salman, the Saudi ruler, and for example, I, I understand he, he isn't going to attend, but representatives of the Chinese government have been invited. And there was confusion over whether the Chinese delegation would be allowed to view the lying in state, because last year the Speaker and the Lord Speaker had banned the Chinese ambassador from the parliamentary estate because they'd sanctioned a number of MPs and, and peers after they had criticised the Chinese uh, human rights record and their abuse of the Uyghurs. That's right, and there was certainly a plan for that ban to continue until something suddenly changed over the weekend. Um, we know not quite what, but uh, it's pretty clear that uh, a diplomatic incident was on the cards at that point. Um, and this is the this is why these occasions are so thorny from a, a, a diplomatic point of view, because traditionally you would invite all um, heads of state or, or, or heads of government of, of countries that you have diplomatic relations with, and that is almost everybody. Um, and so you do get these rather uncomfortable situations arising. And of course, it, <laughs> the fact that they're putting them all on buses together to drive them in brings this rather comically farcical note to it. You can imagine these rather uncomfortable situations on the back of the bus with one world leader and one king who maybe don't get on too well finding themselves sitting next to each other sharing a bag of crisps. The speaker was um, denying this morning that he'd been lent on by the Foreign Office to avoid a diplomat against it, but from what we can read into it, it it's that if the Chinese representatives had been invited to the state funeral, then they had a right to go to the lying in state. But the ban on the ambassador from last year, that continues. And normally it is up to the, the speakers who, who comes and goes into Westminster Hall. It appears that on this occasion, given the Queen was lying in state there, they didn't necessarily have total control of that situation. Mm, I think, you know, there's, um, there's this question in Westminster Hall, who has jurisdiction Indeed. over it? Because it's the, the two speakers, but then also the Lord Chamberlain, who represents the royal household. So uh, lots of discussion going on. But, but Kim, I mean, for, from your point of view, diplomatically, what do you make of it? Um, should the Chinese have been banned? Um, I don't think so. I mean, first thing to say is this would have been Foreign Office advice, thought quite carefully about. I'm sure they paused over, over China, uh, for example, and over Saudi Arabia. Um, but it would have been signed off by the Foreign Secretary and then gone across to number 10 and they would have signed it off too. So this is a government decision. This isn't some decision by, uh, by a junior official. Um, China, yes, you, you, you would pause about it because of their human rights record, because of the Uyghurs and all the rest of it. But, but, first of all, I mean, the Queen visited China, historic state visit back in 1986. There was that brief golden age when President Xi came here, state visit in 2015, would have been hosted by the Queen. This is the second biggest economy in the world, the most populous country in the world. Dare I say that we have huge economic interests in China. And we need to develop a constructive relationship with, with them in the future. So I think on balance, though I would, I would accept that, that you can get accusations of inconsistency, on balance is the right decision to invite them. And within the context of what's happening in Ukraine and the fact that you saw President Xi meeting President Putin? Yeah, I think Xi's made a very bad call on chumming up with Putin because he's backing someone who might well turn out to be a loser Yeah. But I would still have both invited Xi and not invited Putin, who has, after all, invaded another country and brought, brought death and destruction mm. to hundreds of thousands of people. And Jack, of course, then Liz Truss heads off straight after the funeral to the UN General Assembly, where there will be more face-to-face -face meetings and that bilateral with President Biden. That's right. Politics restarts with a bang for her straight after the funeral. She goes straight out to New York, flying overnight, and then we'll be having these important meetings. She'll be giving her first speech to the UN as Prime Minister, which will be a big moment for her on the international stage. 
stage. And yet, of course, there's no relationship more important to any British Prime Minister than the one with uh, the United States President. So uh, she'll be hoping that goes well. Of course, you've got this undercurrent of the row over the Northern Ireland Protocol aspect of the Brexit deal going on, which we know Joe Biden feels very strongly about, which we know his party feels very strongly about. And he suspect that's going to make for some awkward conversation for her, given that that is still rumbling on in the background. Jenny, as somebody who's followed uh, the, the Brexit uh, ins and outs for, for a long time, do you think that if you have a, an opportunity like this, face-to-face -face meetings, it could calm nerves? Uh, if Liz Truss has meetings with the Irish Taoiseach, the US President, is there a way through on this Northern Ireland Protocol issue? Well, there is definitely a way through, and there's always been a way through, and that's through dialogue and through negotiation. And Joe Biden's been very clear that uh, what he would prefer is a negotiated outcome. That happens to also be the Labour Party position. Um, and the unilateral moves that the government seems um, determined to take still, given everything that's happened, um, you know, the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill is still on the books, waiting for its its next reading in the House of Lords. Um, you know, it is, it's quite an extraordinary situation. I do hope now, um, given everything that's happened, the things that have been said, and perhaps a slightly more calm, mature mood um, at, the top of the, at the top of the Tory party, you know, since they've finished their big drama over the summer, that we might see some sense on this, because it, it helps nobody... You know, it doesn't help anybody in Northern Ireland to keep this going and to keep the temperature raised in the way that it is. It doesn't actually help us with our international relationship yeah. when we know that there's been such interest going back decades in um, developments in Northern Ireland, particularly from the Americans. And I just, I just think we're going to end up with a negotiated settlement anyway. So it would be much, much better for everybody if we could just get on with it. Jim, do you think any progress can really be made at gatherings like this? I mean, what what is the value of these face-to-face -face meetings? I don't think you tend to see breakthroughs on contentious issues from brief bilaterals or conversations in the margins of uh, receptions or whatever the kind of things you will have you will have here. There will be more substantive meetings in, in New York in the General Assembly next uh, next week, but not here. But, but, this these encounters, whether in the margins of you know, tonight's reception or tomorrow's reception or bilaterals that might be arranged, they can improve the atmospheric relations between leaders and they can serve to help people to understand the other's positions. And that is useful. It doesn't, as I say, lead to an instant breakthrough, but it's useful. Liz, will have had, Liz Trust will have had briefing from the Foreign Office, I would have bet it's more than 100 pages, giving her something to say to every single uh, head of state or prime minister she might meet tonight or over the next, uh, next 24 hours. And uh, I'm sure she'll read it all and that will give her a basis for using these meetings to achieve something even if it's only the start of a relationship. And how much will President Biden have been prepared about Liz Truss or, or will she be a minor figure to him? I don't think she'll be a minor figure. It's important to any American president to be seen to be having good relations with uh, the British Prime Minister. That's what the American public expects. And he will have had an awful lot of information from um, from the American Embassy in London about Liz Truss and her rise to power and what she achieved in her ministerial career and, uh, and so on. But I doubt very much, I mean, we'll see, whether the biden Truss bilateral in New York is going to lead to a breakthrough on the Northern Ireland Protocol simply because Liz Truss seems to me to be imprisoned by the right wing of her party and to have said things that she can't easily back down from on unilateral rewriting of the Northern Ireland Protocol that the Americans just aren't going to like. What that means is no trade deal either. Nikki Morgan, how do you respond to that? No, I, well, I, I would say that Liz Truss, um, from knowing her, is actually intensely pragmatic and ultimately um, she would always be focused on on delivery, on, on getting things sorted, making things happen. Um, and I think that these meetings are going to be important. Um, I think Kim's probably right, which is there won't be an immediate breakthrough in New York on the Northern Ireland Protocol. But I think the start of that, that relationship and understanding 
uh, as I say, there's face-to-face -face contacts of, of uh, what each side is, is thinking about. Um, but I think Liz will be very focused on a number of issues, of which Northern Ireland Protocol is one, which she needs to get sorted in order to, be able to move things on in, a, in, her, in her premiership. Sure. I think the thing is, we haven't yet seen Liz Truss as, as Prime Minister. She said a lot of things during a leadership campaign. She said a lot of things as Foreign Secretary when she was hoping to become leader. Sometimes when people actually get into Downing Street, you find that they're much more pragmatic and they're prepared to bend in some areas that they would never have dreamed of suggesting that to their party they would do so during a campaign. Kim? Just very quickly, Karen. The other important relationship for Liz Truss on the Northern Ireland Protocol will be with the Taoiseach. And uh, remember, Joe Biden describes himself as an Irishman. The Irish embassy in, uh, in Washington punches way above his weight, and he will be listening to what they're telling him about how they see it. So she needs to actually get on well with the TUSOC as well. Well, as we said, normal politics has been paused these past 10 days, but my goodness, all will change this week. Parliament will be back. There are crucial matters to deal with, not least the energy and cost of living crisis. Let's hear a little bit more now from the Commons Speaker, Sir Lindsay Hoyle. He had some famous clashes, of course, with Boris Johnson over respect for Parliament. So, with a new king, a new government, a new Prime Minister, did Speaker Hoyle think this could be a reset moment? I was quite clear on welcoming the new Prime Minister, say. This is time for reset for all of us. Respect the House, and the House will respect you. If you disrespect the House, the House will have no respect, whoever you are. And I think that's important. And I genuinely believe, all round, that this is a new start for everybody. New King, new Prime Minister, respecting the House, respecting my benches. Because in the end, a Prime Minister is not a presidential system, far from it. They are answerable to the MPs who are elected by the constituents of this country. And they're the people that matter. And that's why they should be treated with respect. Because in the end, a Prime Minister is answerable to their own party and their own MPs, as well as the country. So, let's hope, and I genuinely believe that this is a great opportunity for all to move forward in a new way and a new respect for the House. And you know from your own constituency and from the public that you've been meeting, um, there are huge concerns out in the country, aren't there, about energy bills, the cost of living crisis, and the government action has been paused over the last week or so. Is now then the moment where politics has to resume pretty quickly? You can't have a long, long recess while the political conferences are taking place. I mean, do you just think MPs should get back to this place more quickly and not wait until the 17th of October? Well, the House will sit before that. I'm confident of that. I'm also confident that uh, we should be sitting later in the week. You know, I've got a lot of MPs to swear in. That will be my first job. The government needs to set the agenda. Uh, where we can sit through the week. There's still the very important matter of energy and the future problems that will face all our constituencies. It is certainly not a political point I'm making, but it's important for us all. In the same way that people who struggle to pay the bills in Chorley will have the same struggle anywhere else in the United Kingdom. So we're, everybody is affected here, and I believe that Thursday will be a good day to sit and Let's start sitting and let's start dealing with the problems. That's a Speaker Sir Lindsay Hall. So, Jack Planjard, as, as the Speaker mentioned, Thursday really will be the first proper sitting day we expect this week. I mean, nothing has been formally set out yet, but what's going to happen? Swearing in, uh, MPs swearing allegiance to the new King on Wednesday and then after that? Yeah, there'll be quite a procession of MPs doing that. The, the, the big statement we're expecting on Thursday will be to raise coffee, the new health secretary making her first big speech uh, in that role. And as we know, the NHS has been having a heck of a time of it the last few months, so the government knows it needs to be seen to be on the front foot over that. And so she's going to try and achieve that on Thursday by, set, by setting out some sort of plan to deal with these terrible backlogs that date back through COVID. And then it's all systems go. We're having a, a, a de facto budget on Friday. 
Um, it's not actually a budget, but it's kind of going to look like one because we're going to see tax cuts, the like of which we haven't seen for a long time. Could you just give us a couple of the top lines, what we can expect from that? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it has been um, either mentioned in Liz Truss's leadership campaign or briefed out or leaked out to the papers over the last week or two. She's going to get rid of the rules around borrowing, essentially, so that she can spend loads of money that she hasn't got on either getting rid of some of the tax rises that Rishi Sunak had brought in or was planning to when he was Chancellor, uh, also getting rid of green levies on energy bills. We now find she wants to get rid of the cap on bankers' bonuses, which is a certainly a controversial one, and we're expecting her to remove the ban on fracking as well. And also some mention of possibly new investment zones with uh, different tax rates around the country. Yeah, this is an idea that sort of ballooned out of the free ports idea, which Liz Truss had been very keen on, but it looks looks like they're going to create little parts of the country where they're very keen to get investment into by basically, sl the, the briefing suggests, slashing all regulation, even reducing people's personal taxes who live there. I'm not quite sure literally how that would work. We haven't really seen a system like that in this country, certainly mm -hmm. in my lifetime. Um, but the, the overall message is very clear. Whatever you think of the individual policy that Liz Truss is, going, is, is doing politically, she's trying to send out a very, very clear message to the country that if you know one thing about this new Prime Minister, it's that she is trying to cut taxes to get the economy growing. And if she gets that message stuck in everyone's head, then she'll feel like it's a job well done, regardless of whether people like the individual policies. Yeah, the